Today I'm going to be talking about the forge. So you can see it obviously in all the videos, it's in the background and I use it practically every day to heat up steel but I've never really done a video for you people explaining how my forge works as my forge is a water cooled forge. So today I'm going to just take a little bit of time to explain it to you. Hopefully you can learn something and also maybe if you're trying to build a forge yourself this might help you to make it. Here's the forge. So you can see that we've got this sort of bed here, which is coal slack, is what I would call it. Just all the dust left over, which doesn't burn when you burn coal. And so this is what is insulating the, the steel frame that we have here. So this is just three mil steel plate, which is all the way around. It's a little bit deeper in the middle. So we get a little bit more coal slack just to fill the bottom. So again, it's more insulative. Then we have our, I believe you call it toya, toya, I don't know quite how to pronounce it, but basically a pipe which our air can blow through into the fire so that obviously we can get the coals hot enough to heat up some steel. Above the main sort of fire pot, if you want to call it that, we have our hood. So there's a back plate here, which is sort of acting as a bit of a reflector to bounce the heat back into the forge and to stop heat going through around the back where we have the water tank, which I'll show you in a minute. And then above that, obviously, we've got the hood up here, and then, so the hood and then the flue, which takes the smoke out of the building. Uh, having a bend in the flue isn't the best thing, but I can't go up, as there's another story above me, and it would involve cutting a hole in the roof, which I don't particularly want to do. So at the moment, it goes out the window, which is fine. Um, I do need to do a little bit of modification on this hood because the smoke sort of, your smoke wants to coil up and then go up the flue, but at the moment it sort of comes a little bit out the edge when it's particularly smoky, so when you first light it. So I'm thinking of welding a couple of bits of plate, just sort of three inches, maybe three inches long, just along each of these, these corners here, so the smoke can catch and then go up out the flue. I want to talk about how the forge is water cooled but I sort of want to show you what it looks like at the moment so I'll get you to come around here so you can see the tank so you can visualize it as it is here and then hopefully you can see it a bit better when I draw it out and explain it. This is the tank which is of course full with water and that's the sort of sheet back sheet of the forge as you can see so that acts as a little bit of a reflector just to bounce the heat back into the forge rather than letting it come through and heat up the tank because of course the tank is going to get hot as it is water cooled which is why this one could be a little bit bigger the tank could be a little bit bigger than it is as I do find that if I'm working and doing a lot of forge weld say where the fire is really hot it can boil this water will boil when I'm doing lots of forge welds usually it'll just steam but I have had it before where it boils, which is a little bit sort of disconcerting as you're working on the forge, that this is sort of uh, boiling away in the background there. But that doesn't happen very often, and I find that this tank is just about okay, but a bit of a bigger one would work. The tank has this pipe here, which is where the air comes in from the fan. So the fan blows air through this pipe, and then on the inside of this, there is a load of water. And so the water is what is stopping this piece of steel from burning. It's not its thickness or anything like that. It's the water that is inside of it, cooling it down as the forge is heating it up, which is why the water then heats up. So there's a pipe which goes all the way through and then a pipe on the outside. And in between the two, there is water. But well, that's the basic principle of it. So over there, we've got the fan, which is, of course, what we use to blow air or the thing that we actually need in the air is the oxygen. As the fire is basically just a reaction between oxygen and carbon in the coal. And if you, we're using coke, coke is hopefully pure carbon, but obviously, as you know, it forms clinker, which is silicon, and all of these extra impurities in the coal, which we don't want, which obviously doesn't burn, and so it collects at the bottom of the fire. Anyway, the fan forces oxygen into the fire to accelerate the reaction between the carbon and the oxygen. So we get a hotter fire, which is then what we use to heat the steel up. 
This is my fan. It's just a bouncy castle blower that I've rigged up to a uh, little junction box here, which is basically a variable resistor and a switch. So I can turn it on here rather than turning it on over at the blower. And then, unfortunately, this is broken. So hopefully I'm going to do a video on mending this at some point so I can show you how to uh, wire one of these up so that it will actually work. So this works on basically changing the current that you're putting into the fan so you can alter the revs rather than having a mechanical sort of uh, contraption where you are either letting all the air in or gradually shutting the air off. But that way you're just running the fan on full, full blast all the time and there's sort of no point in doing that. For those of you who were here from the start in May or have gone back and watched the original videos, you'll have noticed that the fan wasn't orange and it was in fact yellow. And that's because I used to have a yellow bouncy castle blower. Um, however, that's unfortunately blew up and set on fire. And so I'm going to uh, explain how that happened. And basically, it's because the fans, or at least the yellow bouncy castle blower, I can't remember what make it was, but I'm pretty sure that that had a sort of safety in. And basically, the fan would cool itself down as the motor would heat up in use, but the air flow through the machine would cool the motor down. Obviously, when you're using the resistor and you're turning the revs down, the fan isn't getting quite as much air in, and so the motor isn't getting cooled down. The fan then had a safety switch, which would switch the fan off, and so it, you'd then have to wait, let the fan cool down before you then could turn the forger on again, which was really annoying, and you had to sort of be careful of how low you were running the revs on it, otherwise it would just keep on cutting out all the time by overheating. And obviously, this happened quite a lot, so it was overheating, and then it would cut out, and then I'd have to wait, and it would do this quite a lot of the time, and so I think what happened was I just burnt out that switch, which would switch it off, and so the fan when it was getting too hot, didn't switch off, and so the motor blew up, effectively. So you've got to be a little bit careful with that when you are buying and looking for blowers for your Ford. You've got to be a bit careful, and I need to really have a look at that old blower, see what make it is, see if that one's the same, and hopefully it isn't the same, so that I can know to run that one at lower revs without the risk of it blowing up or shutting off. So I want to talk a little bit more about the forge. So this is a side blast forge, I did mention that at the start. So obviously the air is coming in from the side, whereas a lot of people, sort of the coal forges, you'll see the air coming up from the bottom. Personally, I prefer a side blast forge, but that's mainly because the only forges that I've ever used are side blast forges. The only time that I've used bottom bottom blast, bottom air fed forges are uh, sort of at shows when I've been using somebody else's forge and so I haven't really had that much experience with them but in my experience I find that they're just a bit awkward to use and you're having to clean the clinker out a lot so that it doesn't build up on the bottom and block all of your air holes. Um, whereas you see here the pipe is about sort of three inches above the air feed is about three inches above the bottom, so you have a space there where the clinker can rest and fall down into the bottom of the forge, so you're not having to clean it out every every hour, which I find really useful. You know, obviously, there's a little bit less maintenance in it. You know, you're not having to opening up the fire to take the clinker out or uh, as often. I think we can leave the actual forge and go over to our lovely blackboard or workbench over there so I can draw out the water coolness of the forge and sort of explain how it works. So I'm going to draw out the forge and then explain what's going on. This is my really bad drawing but hopefully you can see what's going on. We've got the fan here blowing through the pipe through the water cooled tank to create fire. So the water is here all the way up to the top. This pipe here, where the air blows through, so the air is going through there, and you can see that this outer pipe, let's call it, 
is connected to the forge. So this is as if we've split the tank, you're seeing a plane, and we've split the tank through the middle of the pipe. So it's got this inner pipe where the air's going through and then the outer one, and the water is flowing around the outer pipe. So even though it, that it's right next to a fire that could easily melt this steel, the heat is traveling through the, the steel, because steel is obviously a conductor, into the water, and the water is therefore cooling the steel down. Obviously, there is the reaction between our water and the inside of our tank, as the tank is only mild steel, and so the water is going to react with the iron in the steel. Therefore, we form iron oxide, which is going to be rust, obviously, iron oxide, rust, scale, whatever you want to call it. But because the water is hot, you know, it's almost at boiling point, if not at boiling point sometimes, the reaction happens much faster. And so this is because molecules, our water molecules are moving much faster because they have more energy, and so the frequency of successful collisions between those iron particles is much faster, and so we form the iron oxide at a much quicker rate. This is a problem because the inside of the tank and the pipe rust away, and so get thinner, and therefore there you run the risk of them melting because the steel will just be so thin that it will just melt. And so just before Christmas, that was exactly what happened. This pipe melted away. And so I then filled, I was in the next morning. What had happened was the water level had come down to about there. And so you could see that the top side of the pipe didn't have any water in. And so it melted away. So there was a crack forming in there. I then came in the next morning, filled the tank full with water. And this water was gushing out of here, put out the fire and then ran down back through the the air pipe into the fan. Luckily, the fan's all right, but it was a, a hell of a mess, and especially just a couple of days before Christmas, not the uh, ideal situation that I wanted to be in. Anyway, I managed to make up a new end just to weld onto this pipe, and so I have managed to fix it, but I might do another video on putting a new outer pipe in as well as a new inner pipe as you do have to maintain it, as I said, the, the reaction will eat away at the sides and it is a bit of a bit of a nasty reaction that will happen, sort of degrade the steel over the course of a couple of years. I've never changed this. I've had this forge for maybe three years-ish. But it Bill Bill Carter, he was the guy that I got it off, who I've obviously worked with for quite a while and has taught me lots in, in the blacksmithing world. Um, he gave it to me and he's obviously used it for years before then and I don't think he ever changed the, the steel. So it does need a little bit of maintenance just to change this pipe every once in a while. So I don't really know how this works is there's no sort of flowing mechanism. So what I think happens is the water closest to the fire obviously heats up first. This is then hot. So I presume like hot air, hot air would rise. So I presume the hot water rises up therefore creating flow from the bottom of the tank, bringing cold water in. That's my thinking. But of course, once you've spent all of this cold water, you're then just getting the hot water coming back down. And so that's why the, the tank then heats up to near boiling point, or at least you'll get some steam coming off it. When I was fixing this pipe, I was surprised at just how thin the walling was on both the inner and outer tube. It was only about two or three mil thick. That sort of thin steel would easily melt in the fire and yet it doesn't and that's because it is water cooled. But then I was thinking why don't you just make the pipe out of say five mil thick wall? And I think it comes down to the conductivity of steel. We all know as blacksmiths that when you're holding a piece of steel it can be red hot on the end and yet you can hold it in your hand if it's, say, 80 centimetres long or whatever. You can easily hold it in your hand without burning yourself. And that's because steel has a very poor thermal conductivity. Whereas you look at, say, an 80 centimetre long piece of copper, you hold the end of that when 
the end of the copper is red hot, you'll be burning your hand. So here's our fire, there's our steel wall, and here's our water on the other side. To cool the steel down, the water needs to take the energy from the steel. But to do that, steel needs to be a good thermal conductor so that the, the energy from the fire will travel through the steel, heating the water up, therefore cooling the steel down. But to do that, the heat actually needs to penetrate through the steel. And so because steel is a poor conductor, to get the heat to penetrate, penetrate through, the steel needs to be thinner. So if we were to use, say, I don't know, two centimeter thick steel wall pipe, the outside edges of the steel would heat up and burn, or at least this is my thinking, the outside edge would heat up and burn before the heat could penetrate through to the water, so the water would take the energy away. I hope that makes sense. That sort of trying, me trying to describe why I think the walling on the pipe is three mil thick. I mean, it may just be that that was all that Bill had when he came to make the forge. I should probably actually ask him. Uh, but I think if I was to make this again, I would make it out of, say, four or five mil thick pipe rather than sort of two mil, which is what it is at the moment. And it may be that it was four or five mil thick when it was first made and that over the years, the reaction where the steel obviously forms rust has eaten away at sort of the inside edges. Anyway, that is sort of uh, a brief overview of the water-cooled forge, side blast water-cooled forge. I hope that you can learn something from this. And I remember when I was first making my forge, trying to work out my first forge, trying to work out how you can have a pipe which the air flows through into the middle where there's then a fire that would easily burn any pipe that you were put in it. And this is sort of a really good way to do that. And actually I've never, I've never even opened that forge out without the water in to have a look at how it actually is. So it, it melting sort of forced me to do it. And I've even learned something about how this thing that I use every day works. And I hope that you have and maybe even go and build yourself one of these side blasts water cooled forges. So I'm glad that I've done this video of sort of explaining what's going on at the forge so you know a little bit more about what happens when I go and put a piece of steel in the fire to heat it up, or rather how, how the forge works, how it's water cooled, etc. Um, so let me know if you like these more explanatory videos. It's a, sort of almost the style of the, the blacksmithing theory video that I did a little while ago with all those physics equations of how we actually move the steel or rather the physics behind moving the steel and i'll link that video at the end if you want to go watch that you know it's not for not for everyone but go check it out if, if you want to be interested in the science behind blacksmithing so this is the first video back after christmas at the moment this is being filmed in that sort of dead space between christmas and new year um, so i figured i might as well get some videos filmed at the moment before i go back uh, to full-time working in January and at the moment January is looking pretty much as busy as December so hopefully I can still get some videos out to you in that time but I'm trying to get lots done now so that I can then publish them gradually throughout the new year. Also I gave the the workshop a clean this morning it took me about three or four hours but I, I got a brush and literally cleaned up the roof, cleaned all of the walls and then brushed up all the, all the dust off the floor. So hopefully you can see this wall is much whiter now as I've managed to get all of the, the metal dust off it, or at least I hope that you can see it's a little bit whiter. So you've got a, a little bit of a, a nicer background. I mean, it's still not, still not the best background, but it, it's a wall and it holds the roof up. So that, that's, that's all that I can really ask of it. Um, also, I've got a floor now not just a layer of dust that I sort of stand on, it's an actual floor. Um, anyway, thank you for watching the video, hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you soon.